Christ is risen. Christos is crescent. Christ is crescent. Christos is nesti. Christos is nesti. Christos is enviat. 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 By way of announcements, I'd just like to remind our people that our monastery remains closed through the end of May in compliance with the shelter in place order of Alameda County and also with the directives of our diocesan archbishop. So we miss everyone, we're praying for everyone, and we look forward to the day that we can be together and worship again, and not just virtually, but in actual fact. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. This is known as the Sunday of the Samaritan woman, who in the lives of the saints is known as Saint Pochini, based on a root of the word that means light in Greek, phos, like phosphorus, or photon. And so in other languages, she's known as Svetlana in Slavic languages. She's known as Luminitsa in Romanian, or Lucia in um, many of the Romance languages, or Lucy. All these have the root of light. And she was a Samaritan woman, and the Gospel's about her. But what I would like to focus on is just a small part of that Gospel reading, where today we heard in the Gospel our, Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ tell her that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. If God desires to have such worshipers, then it is obvious that He will receive only such worshipers and servants, and they only are pleasing to Him. This teaching of Christ was imparted to us by the Son of God Himself, and as Orthodox Christians, we accept the all-holy teaching of Christ and believe in Him with all our love and all our heart. In order to follow Him carefully, let us look at what it means to worship God the Father in spirit and in truth. First of all, truth is our Lord Jesus Christ, as He Himself testifies of Himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. A variant translation would be, I am the way, I am truth, and I am life. The truth is the word of God. As we hear in the Gospel of John, your word is truth, and Christ is the word of God. This word was pre-eternally in God. It was pronounced by God and to God. This word is God. This Word is the Creator of everything that exists, both visible and invisible. As we know from the Gospel of John and also in Colossians, where St. Paul talks about everything that was created was created through Him. The Word of God before the Incarnation, before the creation of the universe, He was with His Father. This Word became flesh and dwelt among us, we hear in the Gospel of John. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has seen God at any time, the Gospel of John says. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. The Son of God, the Word of God confessed God before people, and fully manifested God to people. The Son of God showed people the truth that was incomprehensible to them, having irrefutably witnessed to it and impressed it upon them by abundantly bestowing divine grace. In the Gospel of John we hear, and of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. This means that Jesus Christ 
brought not some more or less detailed and clear understanding of grace and truth, but grace itself, the favor of God, and truth itself, essentially bestowed upon people and instilled in people. As St. Peter writes in his second epistle, we have been made partakers of a divine nature, sharers of the divine nature. Truth has a characteristic spirit, and this spirit is called the spirit of truth in the Gospel of John. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. It is spirit proceeding from the Father. It is the Holy Spirit of God, as we hear in the Gospel of John. But the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. It is the Spirit of the Son, the Son of God. And because you are sons, as we hear in St. Paul's Epistle to the Galatians, and because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. As inseparably close to the Son, as comprising together with the Father and the Son, one undivided and unmingled divine essence in the Holy Trinity. In accepting the truth, we also accept the Holy Spirit. That is why the All-Holy Truth says of Himself that He will send the Holy Spirit from the Father to His disciples. Naturally, the Holy Spirit of truth will be present where Holy Truth acts and will leave the effect of its action. In like manner, where the Holy Spirit works, there will be an abundant manifestation of truth as the Lord also said to his disciples in the Gospel of John. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Describing the wondrous relationship of the divine word to the divine spirit, the Lord said of the Spirit, He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine, we hear in the Gospel of John, and declare it to you, all things that the Father has are mine. The Spirit shows and manifests to people the Son who is co-natural to him. The Holy Spirit spiritually forms the true Christian and transforms him into a dwelling place of God, we hear in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. He represents Christ and instills him in the inner man, the inner person. As we hear also in that same epistle, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. He makes people God's children by adoption, making them like unto Christ, establishing Christ-like qualities in them, as we hear in the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. People who have been made children of God by adoption turn to Him in their prayers as to their Father, because the Holy Spirit very clearly and tangibly witnesses to the spirit of a person renewed by him, concerning that person's union with God and his adoption by God as a son. In St. Paul's Epistle to the Romans, we hear the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son 
into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, again from Galatians. Such worshippers are recognized as true worshippers of God by God. Such worshippers who worship God in spirit and in truth seek and receive God. The scriptures in holy tradition of the church teach that there is no knowledge of God outside of true Christianity except imperfect knowledge and no true service to God except imperfect service. In the Gospel of John, our Lord himself said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either, he says. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. That's in the third chapter of John. It is impossible to approach God or to enter into any kind of communion with Him in any other way than through our Lord Jesus Christ, if you want to do so in truth. The only intermediary, he is the only intercessor and the means of communion between God and man. He is the God-man. There is no true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ without the mediation of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul, in his first letter to Corinthians, says, no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And in Romans he says, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. It might shock you when I tell you that some of the fathers say there's no virtue outside of Christianity that is worthy of heaven. Does that mean there's no good that people can do or virtue outside of Christianity? Of course not. I'm talking about virtue in the sight of heaven. There's virtue in the eyes of society. There's goodness and good works in the eyes of this world. An example that comes to mind are those who die in battle in defense of their homeland and their people. With bravery and courage, these are virtues, but they have nothing to do with heaven. In Islam, those who die in battle are considered martyrs. Not so in Christianity. There was a Byzantine emperor at the height of the wars between the East Roman Empire of Byzantium and Islam, who tried to pressure the church into declaring that all the soldiers in the East Roman Empire who were fighting against the Muslims should be declared martyrs, but the church refused. They acknowledged the bravery, the courage of these men, and their sacrifice for their people, but this has nothing to do with heaven. On the other hand, those who are true martyrs in the Christian sense, who died for Christ rather than deny him, rather than offer incense to the pagan statues and false gods, but stayed true to Christ and lost their lives because of it, they are hold, this is a great virtue, the greatest virtue perhaps, in the eyes of heaven. So there's heavenly virtues and there's earthly virtues. St. Mark the ascetic in the Philokalia, in his work on spiritual law, says nothing good can be believed in or acted upon unless it be of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And in that, he's thinking in terms of spirituality and in the eyes of heaven. Unworthy of God are natural human good works, which proceed from our fallen nature, in which goodness is mixed with evil, and in which goodness is for the most part <coughs> very noticeable amidst the bondage of evil. Fallen nature is capable exclusively of evil, as God himself testified in Genesis. 
The imagination of man is intently bent upon evil things from his youth. Christian, Judeo Christianity teaches this is a fallen world and that our natural propensity is to be selfish and to not be focused on heaven. Even our Lord in his Sermon on the Mount said, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, such is the worth of natural human goodness before the Gospels in God and the activity proceeding from it. In vain does fallen human nature glorify its great and famous good works. All the measures undertaken by a militantly atheistic regime such as persecuted Christians in Eastern Europe during the time of communism proclaimed they were doing all this for the good of the people. But was it really good in the eyes of heaven? Of course not. Such self-praise shows a terrible blindness. Such self-praise is an involuntary poach against the famous works of men, inspired and nourished by vainglory and pride. The stench of pride coming from these whited sepulchres is an abomination to God. Pleasing to him is the incense of humility. Remember that many things are done for the good of democracy, which is a noble, earthly virtue. But Christ did not come to bring democracy. He came to bring salvation. So heavenly virtues and earthly virtues are very different. And humankind, when it does these earthly virtues, is often unconscious of its own woeful fallenness. And on the contrary, it sees its magnificent triumph and seeks to escalate this triumph of what noble things man has done. For the sake of salvation, we must renounce our shortcomings and our sins, our transgressions. But sin has become so much a part of our normal fabric, woof and warp of society, that it has become part of our nature, part of our very soul, unless we fight against the tide. In order to renounce sin, it has become essentially necessary to renounce our fallen nature, to renounce our own soul. It was our Lord who said in the Gospel of Matthew, He who finds his life will lose it. And he loses his life for my sake will find it. But in the actual original Greek, the words for life and soul are interchangeable, and the word is soul. He who finds his soul will lose it, and he loses his soul for my sake will find it. Just as in English, an SOS is a plea for help to save sailors whose ships have sunk stands for save our souls, but they're not talking about a religious salvation, they're talking about saving their lives. To renounce not only the obviously evil deeds, but also the good deeds of the old man that the world honors and glorifies. It is essentially necessary to replace our worldly manner of thinking with the mind of Christ, and replace our activity motivated by the senses, and the dictates of our carnal mindedness with the scrupulous fulfillment of Christ's commandments. For the Gospel of John said, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What remarkable and deep words. Their direct impact consists in the fact that sin holds man in slavery only through incorrect and false understanding. It is likewise clear that the destructive incorrectness of these understandings also consists precisely in an acceptance of good as good, what is in essence not good, and in the non-acceptance as evil, what is in essence murderous evil. He who is from God hears the word of God, in the Gospel of John, says our Lord. Let us humble ourselves before our Lord God. Unlike the hardened Jewish leaders and the scribes and Pharisees who rejected both the Lord and his teachings, 
Let us show submission to the Lord and obedience to his all holy and saving teachings. Let us set aside the manner of thinking that comes from our fallen nature and from this world, which is at enmity with God. Let us assimilate the manner of thinking that the Lord offers us through his holy gospels. Let us follow the truth, and we shall inherit the truth. The truth frees the human mind from the invisible bonds of error by which sin has shackled it. The omnipotent truth, the all-powerful truth, the almighty truth, having given spiritual freedom to the mind, renewed and enlivened it by life from above, by the word of God, brings it out onto the path of Christ's commandments and removes it from the way of unrighteousness we hear in the Psalms. The soul enlivened by the truth sings hymns together with the inspired prophet in the Psalms. The way of your commandments have I run when you enlarged my heart. Set before me a law, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will seek after it continually. Give me understanding and I will search out your law, and I will keep it with my whole heart. Such a soul will unfailingly become a partaker of the Holy Spirit, who cannot but be present where divine truth is present and reigns. The truth, who in his mysterious counsel with the all-holy truth, speaks of himself thus, I am a partaker with all them that fear you, and with those that keep your commandments. As long as man abides in his fallen nature, as long as he is immersed in the darkness of his exceedingly deep ignorance, he does not know how he should pray. He does not know what he should pray for, and he is incapable of serving God. Only faith in Christ gives knowledge of truth. Faith, expressed by the fulfillment of Christ's commandments, draws the grace of the Holy Spirit to the heart of the faithful. As the God-inspired prophet said, I opened my mouth and drew in my breath, for I longed for your commandments. Only a true Christian, a Christian in faith and deed, can be a true worshiper of God, worshiping and serving God as the Father Spirit and truth. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ Jesus. Jesus.